Amen. Clovis Chappelle, a minister from the previous age, used to tell the story of two paddle boats. They left Memphis about the same time traveling down the Mississippi to New Orleans. And as they traveled side by side, sailors of one vessel made some remarks about the slow pace of the other boat very, very slowly that that boat traveled. And so words were exchanged, and there was challenges made, and as you can imagine, soon there was a race. And the competition was so vicious as those two boats roared through the deep south on the way to New Orleans. But then one boat was falling behind. You see, there had been call for a trip, but not for a race. And that boat, as it dropped out, literally, there was one sailor that took some of the cargo and he tossed it into the ovens. And when the other sailors saw that the supplies burned just as well as the coals, what they did was they filled their boat with the materials that they were destined to transport. In the end, they won the race, but they just lost all the cargo. And do you know, in this story, there is a profound message for every person who wants to bear fruit for Jesus Christ in this world. Even before you can think of being effective, you have to rid yourself of the cargo of the world that would stand in the way that you would be useful for God. And I do believe that St. Paul had even a better comprehension about this because to the Galatians he wrote about the two types of life that we find in this world. The one is run by a person's own agenda. And people have to appreciate that when they live that kind of life, their lives are most often given over to sinful desires of this world. And people who would make their own decisions and keep their own agendas will have to confess that they are exactly in step of what the world wants. And then there is the opposite type of life. And this is the life that all Christians should live. A life driven by God, the Holy Spirit. It is a life that was taken from fruitless to fruitfulness. Because of the transformation that Jesus Christ brought about. And it was like St. Paul pleaded with the Galatians. That they would live in this way with lives driven by the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 4, verse 19, we read the words, My dear children, for whom I am already in the pain of childbirth until Jesus Christ is formed in you. And you see, there has to be a transformation. There has to be a change. You have to go from the old life to the new life, from the dark life to the light life, from the useless life to the useful life. And then St. Paul wanted to give to those people in Galatia and Christians, followers of Jesus, of all generations, advice of how to bear fruit for God. And the first thing that we have to think about is you have to decide where you want to stand. Because in verse 17, Paul says, the desires of the sinful nature is contrary with what the Spirit wants, and the Spirit is against what the sinful nature wants. It's contrary to that. 
And so we have to think about this, the sinful nature against the life by God's Spirit. How can we really understand that? And there's a beautiful illustration that I want to use about this, that we would grasp the thought of St. Paul in this particular verse, and that's of a family who bought a large property, and they were so glad to see that in the corner there was a beautiful apple tree, and they couldn't wait for the season to come so that it could bear apples. But when it came, the apples had marks on them, and even before they could be eaten, they went bad, and they said, well, we just have to wait for the next year. And the next year came, and exactly the same thing happened. And then they decided they would bring an expert in. And the expert investigated and looked at leaves and branches and the apples and everything that he could do. And he said, you have to cut this tree down. And they felt very offended and they felt like we need to go for a second opinion. We are just not going to do this. And then this expert continued, you see, that your tree is planted too close to the red cedar of your neighbors, and it will always be infected. To make a long story short, they had to cut the tree down because negotiations with their neighbors to remove their red cedar came to nothing, and so they planted another tree, and they had to wait quite some time until the tree was big enough to bear fruit. You know what? We have to think about this. We have to, through God, the Holy Spirit, working in our lives, ask this question. Where do I want to make my stand in this world? Where do I want to be planted like a tree and by whom? Would it be in God's soil or would it be in the world's soil? The Bible is very clear, my friends, that we are in this world, but we are not from this world. And it's really sad that we see people more and more, how they live lives as Christians. And they say, well, you know, I can give 80% of my life to God and 20% I can give to the world. And we see more and more people on the territory of the world who get infected by all kinds of theories, philosophies, doctrines, teachings, words, whatever we want to call it. And the worst thing in a person's life is that you can get infected with the structures of this world, the secular world, and that, that would take you away from God. And it can be so bad that when we can infect other people as well, you know, this is worse than COVID-19. I need to tell you that. It is worse than that because this is eternal. And we have to ask ourselves, in the presence of God, this question. Where is my stand? Is it truly on the foundation that Jesus Christ laid? Or is it perhaps true that from time to time I wander off and I just find myself on the foundations of the world? And therefore, we are convicted by God, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, on a daily basis, the Spirit of God would come to us and open us up and ask this question. Are you truly new in Christ? Are you truly living according to the way that God wants you to live? Or are you blending in with the world, the structures of this world, too easily? That sometimes you need to ask yourself the question, but where is my stand? There was a person named Schleiermacher who meditated in the park from a Monday to a Friday. And by the Friday, a worker came and asked him, Sir, who are you? I've seen you in the park every day of the week. But tell me, 
who are you? I'm just interested to know who you are. And Schleiermacher said, who am I? I wish I knew the answer to that question because I don't really know anymore who I am. And if we truly know that we stand on God's territory, then Paul tells us, now you have to strive to live by the Spirit and to demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. And in verses 22 to 25, we read, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we want to meditate on these fruits. Throughout the ages, people ask the question, why is love at the top of this list? And the answer is because love tells us what God is like. Jesus told his disciples, I give you a new command. Love one another as I have loved you. You should love one another. Can you recall when Jesus spoke those words? It was after he removed his outer clothing and he took a basin with water and he took a towel and he washed the feet of his disciples. And with that, he demonstrated love, not just as something you speak, but something you do, something you act. And you see, love has to be something from our hearts, and then we do with our hands. And that when we love, that people will say, this is genuine. This is not false, what you do. This is the love of Christ that you demonstrate to me. Some of you, if not all of you, will recall the name Emily Hophouse. She was a welfare campaigner. And she pleaded for people in British concentration camps. And while she was reaching out to people person to person to comfort them, there were some who made a comment afterwards. When I looked into her eyes, it was just like I looked into the eyes of God. You see, people want to see the love of Jesus in us. And when we demonstrate these acts of love, then they know that it is genuine. Peace is a characteristic that is so much needed in our world. And it's not the peace where people will come with peace treaties and agreements and just to be broken. When nations would come and say, we will not be at war with one another, but it has shown in history how nations went to war even after they said they will not be at war. It is the peace of Jesus Christ. And as he said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, John 14, verse 27. Do you know that there are people longing for peace in this moment? And we can only go and show them the peace if we are at peace with God, if we make that our agenda. And then we can reach out to them in and through the peace of Jesus Christ. Patience is perhaps one of the most difficult fruits of the Spirit. I think we all know and we all can talk about our failures because when we did not want to have that patience, we were too hasty to act and then we failed. But can we appreciate Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And you know, patience is something that would come quite often after a long time of waiting. We can just look at some of the characters in the Bible. I'm thinking of Jacob. Jacob had to wait 
seven years to marry Rachel. And then her father tricked him, Laban tricked him into marrying Leah. You know, we have to see what the good is in patience. And we can just not have a thinking like a therapist who had on his wall, God, give me patience and give it to me right now. Through the conviction and the work of God, the Holy Spirit, we are schooled by God through patience. That will bring perseverance. And that will bring fruitfulness in our lives. We read about kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And with those fruits of the Spirit, it's like we transfer everything of our lives over to God. There's nothing that we want to hold back. And we want to say, it is not that I have to be a winner in every situation. You see, kindness is that act that would win people over for Christ. Goodness is that fruit of the Spirit that will be an answer to all the bad things in the world. Faithfulness is where we will show that we are not like a chameleon, that when we are on a different color, a different territory of the world, that we would change our color and that we would change our conduct, that we would change who we are. No, we will be firm. We will be faithful to God. We will stand for what we believe. And what about gentleness? That can diffuse so many situations. We read in God's Word that a soft word would keep wrath away. And there was a mother who had a 17-year-old teenage daughter. And she was a bit difficult, a bit out of control. And when the mother wanted to talk to her, this teenage girl always started to yell and yell and just walk away. And the mother, she was just so much at the end of a rope. And she went to a counselor and she asked, what can I do, a Christian counselor? And the counselor said, smother her in love. And then each time when this girl held, the mother just said, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's all she said. And then the mother said, I will always love you. And the girl responded, Mom, when you speak like this, I cannot think of what I want to say to you next. It's gone. It's out of my head. Gentleness, so crucial as one of the fruits of the Spirit. And what would we say about self-control? We want to tell people, I will have the last say and you will listen to me and you will hear me out. But you know, the times when we do not respond, we think afterwards, I do not always have to come out on top. I don't really have to have the last say. As I prepare the sermon, this one of the fruits that I left out. Joy. The second one. Joy. And I thought about this as I read over the sermon this morning. And then what came to mind was what St. Paul wrote to the Philippians. I wrote to you about my joy and that my joy through Christ may be complete in your hearts. That's one of the things that we don't see in the lives of all Christians. Because we can be so reserved, we can be so serious. And I want to share with you from my first ministry in Canada something. There was one elder in Fort St. John whose daughter, one of her daughters, was disabled. 
She had severe brain injuries at birth, and she was clustered in a wheelchair. She couldn't speak. She never could get up. She could not do anything on the farm with the rest of the family, like riding horses, going out in the field, do gardening, feed the animals. Nothing. But when we sang Amen, it's not like the Sing Amen, it's another version of Amen. And when we sang that at the end of the service, Holly just made noises. She just rejoiced. And that had always been an example to all of us. Despite of her circumstances, that she was in a wheelchair, that she could never speak, that she could not eat food like we eat, like she could not do the things that we take for granted. She had joy. And we have to think about that. We have to be grateful. We have to be filled with joy. We have to say, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. We have to think of that hymn. Friends, how many of the fruits of the Spirit do we have in our lives? There are nine mentioned here in Galatians 5. 22. And I don't think that God wants us now all to have some kind of competition here and to say, well, I'm going to stand up because I have nine or I have eight or seven or something like that. That's not what God wants. God wants us to have a spirit-filled life. That's what He wants from us. And that we show through our devotion to Him and our love to one another and all the other fruits of the Spirit, that we are bearing fruit for God. What will change the world? Would it be loss of the Christian faith and doctrines that we go and hammer people with? No. It would be by our example. And one that I can think of, again, is what Jesus said about love. By my love, people will know that you are my disciples. Let us strive to be people bearing fruit for God. Amen.